Have you ever encountered adversity and bounced back and through the process became a better version of yourself? Today, we will hear such a story. But first, let's look at the good news around the world. Okay, so what are some of the good news that happened uh, this past, past couple of weeks? What's Let's your favorite, see. Lily? My favorite is Taylor Swift. Oh, what's happening there? She, you know, she's, who hasn't gone to her concert except for us, but everybody I know has gone to her concert, and she's making a lot of, a lot of little girls, women, even men, very, very happy at these concerts, okay? So that's already happiness there. But she earned a lot of money, uh -huh. a ton of money. Yeah. And she gave her, like, truck drivers mm -hmm. 100K a piece. Mm. So that's, that's what did somebody say? Life-changing. It's life-changing. Mm -hmm. um, to not hoard it for yourself and to share. Mm. That's really good. And that's why everybody loves Taylor Swift. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, well, you know, what would you say to someone, you know, she can't do that because she had lots of money? She does have a lot of money, but she didn't have to. It's true. So does, do you think average people can do that? I mean, I don't mean give a million, but be generous like that. Sure. Meaningful. Give meaningfully. Yes. I mean, mm. do you all, I'm sure people give their... Um, Yard guy, a bonus mm -hmm. for Christmas. That's true. Yeah, right? comes Christmas. It's yeah. little things like that. I think yeah. it's the showing of a. Pre I think more than money itself. I'm sure for the truck drivers, the money is is speaks very loudly because it probably helps their livelihood. Um, but it's being recognized and being appreciated. Appreciated. Yeah. And also, you know, not not just give financially but you know maybe like giving the time to give a hand mm -hmm. you know, and, you know mm -hmm. that, that's important too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 which one's your favorite of all the good news that you saw lately well i saw one today on the hello world uh posting it was really sweet to see this two this older couple they're probably in their I don't know, 80s, <laughs> uh, you know, and they're just running around in, in the beach, uh, chasing each other, being very playful and um, really acting much younger than their age. So it's very, it put a smile on my face. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 They're so playful. They're so playful. They're so, so what, what, uh, what feeling does it create in you to, when you look at this? Makes me ready to go to the beach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, I mean, even, even uh, yeah, sometimes you don't want to act your age, right? Age is just a number. You got to, no, I, I like the fact that the husband and wife being, you know, uh, up in, the, in years are still know how to have fun together. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a. Uh, how do we know, know their husband and wife? Oh, maybe they're having the fair. Oh. <laughs> is that what okay. you're suggesting? Let's bring it back to the good news. Okay. <laughs> This is a family show, Lily. <laughs> Gee. Oh, wait, it says growing old together. Oh, yeah, man. growing old together. Exactly. Okay. That's what we look forward to. And now, let's meet Daniel. When he was 17 years old, he suffered a traumatic brain injury. But now, he's a social worker helping others. Let's meet Daniel. <laughs> Welcome to our podcast, Daniel. Thank you for joining us to share your story. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Thank you. Well, you know, I was thinking about how I was, I was going to introduce the first question because there's no easy way. Yeah. Uh, your story had kind of a tough beginning. Um, it did. And uh, if you could just share with the audience, what was that uh, incident? Yeah, so the kind of real beginning that gave my life a lot of purpose and direction was a mm -hmm. traumatic brain injury from an auto accident. My going into my 
senior year of high school. Mm -hmm. So July um, in that summer, summer mm -hmm. gap. And from that accident, you know, we rolled four times, two times on the cement, one time in the, in the ditch, and then one time into a field, a nice. farm field. You know, I was knocked unconscious. The driver of the vehicle, because it was just a one car rollover, mm. was not knocked unconscious and was able to really find, find our cell phones, call for help, call EMS. And then when EMS was there, in assessing me since we were in rural a rural area of Wisconsin where I'm originally from okay they take me to just just like a regular hospital mm -hmm. and uh, like just coincidentally his mom is a nurse and spoke to the EMS providers and was like hey if he has head injury he mm -hmm. needs to be checked into a higher level trauma unit or hospital because by the time you check him in there, get him over assessed and then mm -hmm. send him back over, he could be dead or brain dead. So then they, they pivoted where they were going to take me and they took me to a higher level trauma. So I really credit those two people, the driver who is my next door neighbor, uh, where I grew up as well as his mom with a big part of saving my life. Wow. So you, you guys were in the summer probably. Yeah. It was like five o'clock in the afternoon. Just you know, have we going just going so going about your summer day, and yeah. lo and behold, um, yeah. what triggered that rollover? So the it was kind of a SUV type vehicle. Mm -hmm. The right two wheels went off the road, and mind you, this is rural Wisconsin, so mm -hmm. it's just gravel on the side of the road. Right two wheels went off, and then. The driver corrected we were in the oncoming lane because it was just a two lane and then corrected again and when when it was corrected again the vehicle just kind of ripped the, ripped the cement and went and from there i was i had to have brain surgery i had a stroke in my left front frontal lobe mm -hmm. fractured my skull and then i had a collapsed lung workers on the icu unit were just just told my parents like we don't know if he'll make it through the night if he does the next 24 hours are really going to show us a lot in terms of what his recovery may look like if it might be slow if it might be fast and they kept me in a coma for three days wow and i don't know the number of nights afterwards but they would allow me to come out of the coma during the day and then they would put me back in for a few nights why, so why did they body. keep you in the coma is to prevent stroke additional um or to calm your brain probably i think i think to calm my mm -hmm. body um to not allow a lot of sensations mm, I see. there because one of the things even when i was in the coma they told my family that like you can't touch him right now because of the sensations in his body um oh. his body went through so much so you can't even touch him um so they could just look at me right <sighs> And I mean, thinking of that from like a mother or a father perspective, right? Or older sisters and stuff like that. Um, yes, because you uh, want to was, like hug them close, right? Right, right, right exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so I did 10 days in the ICU. And then after that, did seven days of inpatient rehab. And that was a lot of physical therapy. I did some occupational therapy, some or a lot of speech therapy. So that so your immediate so brain surgery and then you had um, re, like I guess rehab um, yeah, work seven done, days or rehab. Yeah. Then tell me more about your more extended recovery. What does that look like? And um, how did you? What was the? I guess at the you know, whether you're discharged from the hospital. What was your outlook? When I was in the ICU, they told me I probably wouldn't graduate high school with the cohort that I started, and I told them I would. Mm. And I don't know why I said that, like if that was just stubbornness or what. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because as as kind of the meds fade, right? Because you're on some pretty pretty potent meds while mm -hmm. you're in the ICU and kind of phasing out. You know, it's it's very foggy after a brain injury. Can't think straight fatigue levels through the roof sleeping mm -hmm. you know 14 16 hours a day taking naps like wow. just going to the bathroom is exhausting mm -hmm. and so my first thing was okay we're home right what do we do 
And from that process, my my mom was taking time off work. One of my, my oldest sister at the time had rearranged her undergraduate schedule, school schedule to be able to be at home mm-hmm. to, you know, so my oh. mom couldn't be off indefinitely because she's still working, right? Family. Uh, so it definitely took a lot of support. And, you know, then this question came of like, are you going to go to school? Right. And what is if you do, what is that going to look like? So then we had to rope in my high school and they were so supportive. They allowed me to do two half days of school um, the first semester. Yes. And I, and I would come home because we had the block schedule. Mm-hmm. So it was like mm-hmm. an hour and a half, you know, mm-hmm. hour and a half class or hour and 20 some minutes, whatever it was per period. So I did two two of those classes and I would come home and take a two or three hour nap. Yes. I was just, spent. you know, I feel like from that time forward, right, from when, when mm-hmm. I got home from the hospital, I didn't really have all too much of a plan. Like I wasn't like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. It was just kind of like, Let's see where you're at in a week, right? Let's let's see, because it was you feel so out of place in terms of your body doesn't mm-hmm. look the same, your head doesn't feel the same, your thinking isn't the same. And as a 17 year old, you know, turning 18 soon, like that's your identity, like you're forming it at that period of your life. Yes. So to not be able to hang out with friends, to not be able to go to bonfires on Friday night, right? Or do things that they were doing, like going to play pickup basketball games because you were already asleep at seven, right? Like Mm. those things, there's a lot of guilt and shame and just grief and loss in terms of those processes. Yes. Uh, Because that's the best year. Senior year, you finally made it, right? Because senior year, especially, I don't know if you, it sounds a lot, sounded like you went to, you live in, you grew up in a smaller town. So school is the hub. Yeah. Is that, yeah, is that was, correct? There some kids in high school. Yeah. So that was you your know? hub of life. And, and now you're yeah. kind of a little bit sidelined um, because of the injury. Mm-hmm. Wow. So so they told you you're not going to graduate with the group. And I guess it's not, it wasn't uh, insensitive of them because it, like you say, it took you uh, the whole, all your energy just to go to the restroom. Yeah. Right? To yeah, think yeah, about I mean, going I to classes and stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. They were being realistic, I think. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. You don't want to set you up for a failure either. Mm-hmm. But I also think that sometimes our world operates by what is said and not like what our capacity or what our internal strength might be. Yes. And we sometimes buy into that. Right. Yeah. So were you before your your incident your accident? Um, did you have that personality of uh-uh, don't tell me I can't? I grew up rural Wisconsin farming, mm-hmm. you know, 12 hour days already in sixth grade on the farm, mm. uh, grew up playing sports. So like definitely that push yourself mentality. Sure. I definitely just have innate stubbornness from my parents. Um, <laughs> you can thank them for so, that. Right? <laughs> right. Right. So, and it has its good times and it has, and it has bad, hard times too. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so I think it was a culmination of those things, but mm-hmm. it also just wasn't me. I mean, it was my speech therapist that I got to see two to three times a week yes. going through 17 months of speech therapy, right? 17 like, months? Wow. Mm. So really like getting to know her, her getting to know me, right? Mm-hmm. But also like being able to sit with me when she's asking me like, what are the different forms of there that you can remember? And I'm like, only one. Mm. Like, you know, like, should I, should I know more? Right? And I know I should know more. But I can't tell you what they are. So during that 17 months or however long your your recovery journey was, um, because today you're, I wouldn't have known you had a traumatic brain injury. So kudos to all the therapy and and all the um, support that you received and plus probably your own um, hard work. Yeah. What um, did you think you will? Was there a time that you thought I, I may not fully recover or because you talked about you don't even look the same, you, you know, everything is different. Um, did you ever think you would, was there any doubt that something may not go back altogether, hundred percent? That's a good question. I don't know if it was conscious doubt, right? It was more of just like 
let's take this thing day by day, week by week, right? And see where mm. we're at in three months, six months. And I think you start building momentum. So they took my license after I was in a in had brain surgery because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> probably not the best thing for me to get right. behind a wheel, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so I got my license back, I want to say like October or November of that same year. Mm. And But I had to retake the test. And then I started working out again. And like you start to build like momentum and, I think the probably the hard some of the hardest times for me specifically were, you know, in the inpatient rehab bed and kind of coming not not coming to terms, but like it's starting to settle in, right? Like okay, like I'm not going home right mm-hmm. now. And then the other times were some of the post concussions that you would get because your head is already so sensitive, right? So any kind of minor like you bump it on a cupboard that's left open and concussion right and like those concussions then mess with your sleep and then they get intertwined with like okay i can't fall asleep now you get anxious to go to sleep so you don't even want to go to sleep and like those battles inside your head were so for me were so difficult Mm. like i would just i would just i would go to bed at eight so i could fall asleep by 10 right oh wow where most people are like, okay, I'll go to bed, probably, you know, go to bed, fall asleep in a half hour, 20 minutes, yeah. whatever it is, depending on my day. But for me, I would have to like time out my day, right? Wow. When I would go to sleep and like those things are really challenging to mm. do when I would get those concussions. And I was, I, I noticed I was like, is this ever going to go away? Mm. Right? Like those pieces. Yeah. You, so. you share with us um, when we met you previously um, in our previous call, that it took a village to help you recover. Yeah. Were there any um, one or two individuals or groups or people that really were pivotal to your recovery? And, um, you know, if they stepped out of their normal course of besides mm-hmm. their role to to really have encouraged you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, A, the, the driver, right? Like, even though this was an accident outside of my family, he was the only person I would trust to drive me somewhere mm. because he saved my life. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, him and I still talk almost every year on the anniversary, at least, at least a message or a text or something. Obviously my mom was huge, right? Taking time yeah. off of work, working from home. My sister too, for being able to rearrange her, her work schedule, or I'm sorry, her college schedule, right? Yes. To be at home. Um, even though she was taking college classes during the summer. Mm -hmm. Um, And then also my school community, right? Being able to say, okay, like, this is how we can adjust to make sure you still graduate with enough credits. It'll be the bare minimum, but you'll still graduate, right? Yes. And just kind of that community, friends, and how they supported me in Mm -hmm. terms of, you know, making sure hallways in high school can get pretty rambunctious, right? Yes, yes. And... You know, they were they were aware enough that when I walked by, they would kind of settle down, right? So I didn't get bumped and fall over because I didn't have my full gate or balance yet. Mm-hmm. So, wow. yeah. Well, it's thank you for sharing. I'm sure um, it's not fun to relive um, those moments, but I think it helps people to understand where you came from um, mm-hmm. and and That's how th- what it wasn't an easy road to come back to. And yeah. so easy, I think so easy to give in to the circumstance and said, this is it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, and some people don't try to recover as well as they can because they probably felt defeated. Um, yeah, right. And, and we're always going to get, anyone is going to get hit with that level of adversity. Mm-hmm. And it might be in different forms, right? Mm-hmm. Traumatic brain injury, cancer, suicidal thoughts, yes. whatever it might be. And like we have those choice points or mm-hmm. pivotal points where we can say like I'm going to use this as a foundation, even though I don't even know how I'm going to. Mm-hmm. Right, and it might be five years from now. We don't know. That's right. Did you always have this type of positive outlook? Because you seem very positive now. There was positivity beforehand. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was to the level of where it's at. And what I mean by that is. Before the accident, I didn't really know where I was going with mm-hmm. my life. You know, maybe a business degree, maybe the military. Mm-hmm. Afterwards, you know, I, and my brain was starting to clear. <laughs> I, w- I talked to my sister, um, who was also going to school for social work, mm-hmm. and 
Yeah, I was like, I wanna, I'm, I'm gonna end up in this helping sector. I don't know where though, right? Nurse, doctor, PT, OT, speech therapist. And then she was like, check out social work. Mm -hmm. And I was like, interesting. So, so I looked at the curriculum, like, okay, let's do this. Like, it sounds pretty cool. And I, I loved it, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it was from my own experience working with the speech therapist, my own mental health therapist, mm -hmm. right? Or one -on, just being one-on-one -on -one with the physical therapist and those different forms of service delivery. That I was like, I kind of want that one-on-one -on -one piece, right? Where we can make those big gains. And you can't really do that with a bachelor's in social work because you can't be you can't be licensed. You can't um, you can't do individual therapy or group therapy or couples. It's working. You can work at some level in in medical or mm -hmm. veteran hospitals, but you can't do the individual therapy stuff. So I was like, okay, let's do this, right? And then signed up, and you know. So you have a master. A a mas you have a master's in. Yes. In yeah, so I have, I have my bachelor's and master's in social work. So wow, that's so that's great. So you're not only um, able to finish your bachelor's, but you went on and get your master's um, yeah. in a helping sector, which I like yeah. how you how you said it, in a helping sector. So tell us how are you using your um, helping sector training? Mm -hmm. How are you helping right now? Yeah, so I when I graduated or. When I was in my master's program, I did an internship at a psychiatric hospital, mm -hmm. and I still work there today as a as a licensed clinical social worker. So I okay. worked there full time, and then I also started my own private practice. Mm -hmm. I started it as just kind of a side thing, and then as time went on, I was like, wow, I can really put my touch on this and like hone into a my experience of TBI recovery and provide TBI related therapy and support and consultation and coaching, as well as you know, there are other parts to TBIs. There are other parts to how those TBIs are sustained or may manifest, right? So also doing trauma and PTSD and complex PTSD work. Um, and then because I work at a psych hospital, I also have seen and worked with a lot of different mental health challenges. So schizophrenia, psychosis, mm -hmm. bipolar, depression, anxiety. I, I can all, I also work work with those right now. Wow, okay. And, and, and like you say, they all... Uh, TBI, just to remind our viewers, it's the, it's traumatic brain injury, right? TBI. Um, you're using your recovery experience and now you're coaching others um, that, who may be going through recovery experience, whether it's traumatic brain or other um, recovery. That, that's usually a journey. Yeah. Yeah. And usually, usually I don't share it off the bat. I mean, it's on my website so people can read about it if they want. Right. But not everyone looks at the about page. There's like, I need therapy. Right. Um, so I share it, you know, at a crucial moment when maybe they're really challenging and I ask for that invitation of, can I share a little bit here? Um, that may, may be, may be of some, you know, support or just validation because it is, it is long. I mean, I still have to pay attention to not hitting my head. Right. I still can't, you know, go snowboarding on the side of a mountain because, I mean, I guess I could, but if I fall, it would be disastrous, right? So, like, why take that risk? And I think recovery is can be very much the same in terms of, okay, like, you know, maybe you're 10 years from, 10 years clean of alcohol or substances, and you're like, maybe I could try again, right? Maybe I could control it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can. History may say something different, right? Um so, so looking at those pieces and not just recovery from addiction, but also just recovery from trauma, recovery from anxiety or, or even schizophrenia, right? Well, we are a good news podcast. And I think, thank you so much for sharing your, um, your hard experience. But I think at the end, um, there, the good news is there. I can hear your uh, gratefulness of those who have been part of your journey in recovery mm -hmm. and, and really saving your life at the get-go with the um, mm -hmm. sharp thinking of calling <laughs> my mom's a nurse let me call her and making sure that and she told the paramedics to take you to the mm -hmm. the appropriate hospital um, but what what propelled you to come on the podcast today what sto what's the story you want to um the bottom line that you want to share with the viewers 
And again, links links back to what we were talking about earlier, where mm-hmm. we have these difficult situations that arise. No one's immune to them. And will they suck and be shitty? Yes. And we can still live out our values despite that stress or that shittiness, right? Yes. Be it, you know, traumatic brain injury or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Um, will it be easy? I can't say that it will be. But we can still pursue our values despite xyz happening right and i think when we're in our values we're able to have a sense of ease in life or just a sense of connection that we're living authentically Mm. versus moving the other direction Mm. yes well thank you so much for really sharing and um being vulnerable and hopefully my questions wasn't too probing (laughs) oh it was great thank you so much for allowing me to be here yeah i i'm 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 just um, moved by how you're not letting a situation that is bad um, to define you. You mm-hmm. redefined your your situation, and you took it from I, from a 17 year old who didn't know what you were going to do next to I want to be in a helping situation, and and you went for it not just in a casual way you said i have to have a master's degree in order to make a difference and you you did what you have to do and you're still doing it today so congratulations i um you you know like i said in the beginning it's really hard to start this out there's no nice way to say what happened other than it something bad happened (laughs) but you Mm -hmm. you you didn't let that be your defining moment you had you you triumph over that so that's that's the the um, something to really to celebrate and congratulate you. Yes, of course. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you for joining us. And um, I hope you have, you're, you're going to be able to help a whole bunch of other people um, down the road. And um, like you say, things happen. Um, hopefully they come across someone like you who can give them the, the support, the vi- be part of their village. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Take care. And that brings us to the end of another exciting episode of Hello World. Please support our podcast by hitting the subscribe button. Also, don't forget to smash that like. Your likes will help our podcast reach more awesome people like you. Lastly, tap that notification bell to receive instant alert whenever we drop in a new episode. We can't wait to see you again on our next episode. Until then, keep on being a positive force in this world.